I'm watching House of the Dragon. So yeah, they did a cesarean section, which they did do in the medieval ages, but they waited until the mom died before they tried to extract the, the fetus. They wouldn't have just torn her open while she's alive and somewhat well. And what makes me mad about that scene is that they didn't, I mean, they didn't even try to stop the bleeding. You guys like my cat? Gosh, she's so mean about carnal copulation. And abject and filthy. Nature hath endued the genital parts with more exact or exquisite sense than the other parts. Isn't that funny? To bedew, to make wet with, covered with or as if with dew. So bedewed is moistened. So he's talking about how like horrible and dirty it is to procreate, but our genitals have a wise sense about us and our genitals understand that it's really important for the survival of our species to procreate even though it's so disgusting. So good good for those diligent genitals making us want to procreate. And I mean he's got a point especially on the female side of it. She might get pregnant and then die from being pregnant or get prosecuted for a miscarriage. Yeah. God. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. It's so crazy. Yeah. But the testicles of men concoct the more perfectly for the procreation of the issue and the testicles of women more imperfectly because they are more cold, less weak and feeble. But the seed becometh white by the contact or touch of the testicles, because the substance of them is white. But out of all doubt, unless nature had prepared so many allurements, baits, and provocations of pleasure, there is scarce any man so hot or delighted in venerous acts, which considering and marking the place appointed for human conception. The loathsomeness of the filth which daily falleth down unto it, and wherewithal it is humected and moistened, and the vicinity and nearness of the great gut under it, and the bladder above it, but would shun the embraces of women. Well, this chapter is called Generation of Man. He starts with copulation, and then it's all about childbirth and like being, I'm not sure how much he talks about being pregnant, actually. How to get babies out of the womb. It does take him a while to get there. He talks an awful lot about the seed and this weird, these weird theories he has. Like, men that use too frequent copulation oftentimes, instead of seed, cast forth a crude and bloody humor, and, times, and sometimes mere blood itself. And oft times they can hardly make water but with great pain, by reason that the clammy and oily moisture which nature hath placed in the glandules called prostate to make the passage of the urine slippery. I mean, what? He's saying that sperm, whatever liquids the prostate create, is you need that stuff for your urine to come out and to defend it against the sharpness of the urine that passes through it so that afterwards they shall stand in need of the help of a surgeon to cause them to make water with easy, with ease and without pain by injecting a little oil out of a syringe into the penis. Um, so yeah, I don't know what his explanation is for women who have blood in their urine or women that can't urinate. He does talk about women having testicles on the inside. So maybe, yeah, I don't know. He's talking about men having too frequent copulation. So I wonder what he thinks happens to women with too frequent copulation. I think he's mistaking prostate cancer for too frequent copulation. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah, and who knows what else causes blood in the urine, because that's not always cancer. So babies look like the dad because the woman is, of course, always thinking about her husband more than the husband is thinking about his wife when they have sex. This Ethiopian queen did not cheat on her king with a white man. She just thought about some glorious white thing with a very vivid imagination. They don't say what white thing that she was imagining, even though it was very strong imagination. <laughs> Although I guess what we're supposed to think is that she was because she confessed that she was thinking about 
probably a white man. Yeah, that makes sense. So she was just, she was just imagining that the king was white, uh, some white man, and therefore the baby was white. <laughs> yeah. But all that aside, do not ever have sex after a, a funeral or anything sad because then your baby will be sad for its whole life. And maybe that's why some people have depression because their parents had just come back from something sad when they got pregnant. When the husband cometh into his wife's chamber, he must entertain her with all kind of dalliance, wanton behavior, and allurements to venery. But if he perceive her to be slow and more cold, he must cherish, embrace, and tickle her, and shall not abruptly, the nerves being suddenly distended, break into the field of nature, but rather shall creep in by little and little, intermixing more wanton kisses with wanton words and speeches. Oh, handling her secret parts and dugs. So dugs are breasts. First foment her secret parts with the decoction of hot herbs made with muscadine or boiled in any other good wine. And put a little civet or musket or civ musk or civet into the neck of the womb. That is a, a definite way of getting a yeast infection. Like, that is so bad. When the man departs, let the woman lie still and quiet, laying her eggs. And isn't it so interesting? It's just as interesting. <coughs> oh. <coughs> okay, type of strong and more or less sweet wine. 1570s from French. From Italian Moscato, or literally musky flavored, from Muscatus, from Latin Muscus, musk, earlier Muscadine in the 1540s. Okay, here I, yeah, thanks, George. You got it. Oh, oh from testicle. Oh, right, musk is like testicle, testicle scent. Yeah, they made a lot of perfumes with deer testicles. Muscatel. Strong sweet wine made from musket grapes. We don't want any seeds to spill out of the body at the time of copulation. After conception, spots or freckles arise in their face. Their eyes are depressed and sunken in. The white of their eyes waxes pale. They wax giddy in the head by reason that the vapors are raised up from the menstrual blood that is stopped. Okay. Wow. Sadness and heaviness grieve their minds with loathing them and waywardness by reason that the spirits are covered with the smoky darkness of the vapors. Pains in the teeth and gums and swooning oftentimes cometh. The appetite is depraved or overthrown with aptness to vomit and longing whereby it happeneth that they loathe meats of good juice and long for and desire illaudible meats. Ew. Dill pickles? Oh, yeah! Vinegar! Dill pickles. Yep. Good catch. Yeah. So in Gita Sholiak, he talks about the legs of a pregnant woman being hard. And the doctor, it's, a, it's actually a doctor who's translating this. So that's helpful. And he makes the comment, like, it sounds like... Okay, deep vein thrombosis in pregnancy. So wasn't Ambrose Perry just saying that that's normal to have varicose veins in the legs? Eclampsia. So that was a frequent cause of maternal death in the 1920s. Endometriosis. No, that's... I don't think that's a pregnancy thing. I think... What is that? Painful disorder in which t t tissue similar to the tissue that normally lines the inside of your, your uterus grows outside of your uterus. Preeclampsia is a complication of pregnancy. You might have high blood pressure, high levels of protein in urine. So here, let's look at the symptoms. I'm just looking at the, the symptoms that someone in the 1500s could have seen. They would definitely not be able to know if there's excess protein in the urine or decreased levels of platelets in the blood. Yeah, I feel like Dr. Perry would think that that's probably normal. Oh, you know what else is interesting? <laughs> he thought you should not 
get, let the baby nurse for five days after it's born. Most full-term healthy babies are ready and eager to begin breastfeeding within the first hour, within the first half hour to two hours after birth. So five days. He said, he said you should not feed your baby for five days after it's born. <laughs> like, no wonder, no wonder babies died all the time. I mean, is that for real? Like, you definitely do not want to listen to your doctor's advice. Like, five days you don't feed your baby? Okay, chapter six, that the womb, so soon as it hath received the seed, is presently contracted or drawn together. The soul enters into the body so soon as it hath obtained a perfect and absolute distinction and confirmation of the members in the womb, which in male children, by reason of the more strong and forming heat, is about the fortieth day. What is to be done presently after the child is born? He calls the umbilical cord a navel string. There be some that wash infants at the time in wa war warm water and red wine and uh, rub them with oil. If their ears, if there's like any kind of webbing over their eyes or ears or nostrils and stuff, you gotta cut that away. I wonder what kind of child defects there were because mercury and all kinds of poisons were used as medicine. Oh yeah, he also talks about putting honey in the infant's mouth. And honey, you're not supposed to give infants honey. But yeah, he's like, you should give them honey instead of breast milk. <laughs> this guy's insane. Medieval and Renaissance medicine, very intriguing subject because medicine, medical practices, and society in general, very interesting compared to modern society. Yes, I agree. And, um, and like the entomolo etymology, the words, like the words they use, it, it's all, and just like you get some kind of insight into the, um, culture through the lens of medical diagnoses and, and treatments and things. It's, it's really interesting. I was kind of like making an audiobook on over on Twitch. George R.R. R. Martin was basing his world on the medieval age. So I've got this by Guy de Chauliac from 1353. He talks about doing cesarean sections, but the woman must be dead first. That's all I could find about childbirth. He says, don't feed the baby for five days after it's born. You can give it a little bit of honey, <laughs> which is like, we know now, do not give babies honey. Although it, I did read up on that and it's pretty rare for a baby to have negative effects from eating honey, but it is fatal. Like it's rare, but it's fatal if, if they do get the, whatever the problem is when they eat honey. So yeah, babies died. They were just dying left and right, of course. Like, don't feed your baby after it's born. I just looked it up and you're supposed to feed, or babies are hungry, um, half an hour to two hours after birth. The first hour or two is an important time for babies to nurse and be with their mothers. I was starting a massage and spa museum and so I just started searching for all kinds of historical literature that would reference massage and um, first of all the word that you want to look for is friction and rubbing and, um, and there's a really interesting word too but but friction is the most common one um, the word massage wasn't didn't come into English until like the 1850s I want to say it's been a while since I was doing this research but um, Anyway, um, so, and um, anointing. Anointing is the other word you want to look for. So, um, so yeah, I just kind of came across this while I was looking for, for evidence of massage being used in medical treatments. And this was, like, I want to say by far one of the most interesting things, but there actually is, like, a ton of really interesting documents. But this one really caught my interest because no one else has written it out for like you can't search this this is people have like this is a super famous book and yet it's really hard to to find information on it he's he's known as the father of surgery and yet his works are kind of He's got this whole Wikipedia. He was a surgeon to five different kings in France. Really big on evidence-based science. 
proved that the bazaar stone does not cure poisons. There was this chef that was caught stealing some silverware. So he was going to be put to death. And Ambrose Perry was like, oh, cool. Well, he's going to die anyway. How about we give him the chance to, before he dies, a lot of medicine was done on criminals whether it was dissecting their bodies after they died, because I think that was the only moral way to study a dead body was if it was a criminal. Anyway, they said you can either be hanged or you can be part of this, exper this experiment where we poison you and then you can take a bazaar stone and if you survive, then you'll go free. But Ambrose Perry was like pretty damn sure the bazaar stone was not a cure for poison. So yeah, the guy, instead of having a quick death by hanging, he had seven hours of scru scru um, excruciating pain of dying by poison. But, you know, he proved that the bazaar stone was not a cure for poison. And he's very full of himself about that kind of thing. He's like super down on um women especially like women doing like health remedies he just thinks that they're so unscientific and uneducated like he's so educated but then he goes he waxes on forever about these stupid theories he has about the wind and how which direction the wind is blowing is like tells you what kind of sickness the person has like it's he himself has all kinds of stupid theories that are not based on science yeah so this is what it looks like. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool old book. 1649. But it was written... He wrote it around the 15... I want to say 1560s. But then this, this is the 1649 translation into English. Yeah, it's very cool. It, I've been working on this for a year on and off. It's embarrassing, like the first few things I did working with it. I was like putting it into Illustrator and just trying to clean up, clean up the images, like the smudges and things. I was doing all kinds of stupid things until I finally realized that what I should be doing is making a Kindle version for people to be able to search for words. I've actually gotten, like YouTube has said, I'm being too sexual even, like even just talking about this and they've demonetized me. So I'm putting on like a gray wig and I'm playing with the idea of putting on a fake mustache and beard so that they can't say that I'm trying to be all sexy by talking about medieval medicine. I did a test to see if that really was what the problem was. So I took the exact same sound clip, one of his cures for an inflamed eye, is to cut open the wing of a bird and let the blood drip into the eye. So it was just that it's a like super short, it's a nine second clip. And they said it was it was inappropriate. So I made the, I took that exact sound clip. I just lowered it two notches to sound more like a man's voice. And then I put it to a cartoon man and I uploaded the same content and it had no problems whatsoever. So I know, like I, I had the same title, same description, same category, same, like it was the exact same every, everything, same subtitles. And so that confirmed to me that it wasn't about blood. It wasn't about cutting a bird's wing and blood in the eye like it wasn't about that it was something about me having a female voice and having like i had this red wig on i mean you can you can't even see like that i have boobs like the the webcam like was cut off from here up but they de demonetized that and said it was inappropriate content um, but it was totally appropriate content when it was an old cartoon man with a mannish voice. At some point I've learned that doing a woman doing things with a car is demonetized content. It's it's too sexual. I guess it's safe to assume that you've always been fascinated with higher level readings such since high school. Yeah, yeah, that's safe to assume. Yeah, English, my favorite. And it seems like history should have been my favorite, but I had bad history teachers. It was all about dates and names. It was not about the actual like story of anything. It was kind of silly. <laughs> like It's like history should have been the most interesting class, but they like sucked all the good parts out.
And thank you for this conversation because I'm, I need to find my niche. That's how people get successful is having a niche that they focus on. And I just keep bouncing around because I get bored with something. Or I find out that YouTube won't monetize it once it's already too late. Women working on cars is too sexual. So that won't you can't monetize that. Quite similar. Fascinated with wide range of advanced themes and subjects. Linguistics, psychology, cognitive psychology, etc. But it's hard to focus on one subject when there's thousands. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about having my niche being ADHD. I wonder if that would work. First, I have to write this all down, and then I'm going to make... I guess I could not just do one whole thing. I need to zigzag. I need to start making like an interesting video of some of the cool things I've read in here. Okay, I'm not thinking. People to see. Things to do. Things to do. Things to do. Alternate and historical fiction. Oh, not fiction. Hang on writing track that's probably where i should go sea shanties would be fun oh minx yes <gasps> minx is such a good show what is their thing with teapot raising gentlemen check i mean i like that show but i don't know if i care about it enough to do a fan discussion sea shanty sing-along okay that's something i should probably go to oh i'm only two subscribers short of 1800 nocturnal pirates of atlanta i definitely need to meet up with these people a master class in developing alternate history stories that sounds good i don't know if i care about alternate history actually just um just making like a historical fiction might be fun uh, Victorian spiritualism, temporal ball, formal dance lesson. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, I do. I do like to watch a lot of shows. Right now I'm watching, oh my gosh, what is it? There's, I just finished Better Call Saul, but I wasn't, I didn't like the last two episodes. There's, I want to say there was something I was watching recent. I did enjoy the, this Netflix movie that's out right now, Uncharted. That one's fun. And the guys are cute. Oh, Britannia is one of my favorites. I'm trying to stick to like historical things that I like. Minx is really good. What We Do in the Shadows is really fun. That one's on Hulu. And Vikings. I watched Vikings a long time ago. The Like the first couple seasons are really good and then it just kind of deteriorates. Oh, and I'm not watching Last Kingdom. I couldn't watch the current season of Last Kingdom because it just kind of like utterly deteriorated. I hate what they did with Brita. Shows with really good costuming. Not Britannia. Well, Marco Polo. Marco Polo is one of my favorites. I used to have a an Excel document with all of the movies and TV shows that I watched. I'm like a nerd. If I watch a television show or films, I carry a notebook to dot down notes so I can go back and research subjects and themes brought up. That is pretty intense. We usually both agree. Like if we want to learn more about something, we'll just pause it and, and learn about it right then. That's what the internet is so amazing. And having the internet on your phone. A Franciscan friar's girdle. <laughs> what? What for an analogy? Oh, don't trust the bee in apartment 23. That one was fun. Fargo. Watch lots of House of Cards. I think I stopped when Kevin Spacey, when that whole thing happened. Oh, I think I remember Idiot Sitter being fun, but then I couldn't watch it because it was like on a network that I didn't have. But I, I can't remember. Maybe it was really stupid and that's why. Oh, I should probably have notes. No, I didn't take any notes on that one. Lily Hammer. That one was kind of dumb, but I watched anyway. I was a fan of Man in the High Castle. Marco Polo. You do include a category of which personnel of friends you watched a particular film with. I may ask, why are you so disciplined and organizational? Childhood upbringing. I think it's like some kind of OCD. <laughs> it's definitely, it's not upbringing at all. Mm, I don't know. I've just always, I've always had a thing for documenting. I think it's some kind of OCD kind of trait of just like wanting to document things. Mr. Robot. I forgot about that one. Once upon a time. Oh yeah. This is one. They had the, um, they had the costume designer, or one of the costume designers anyway, from this show at Dragon Con, and I got to see her. There's just so many shows, and m like most of the time, people are like, oh yeah, I worked on this show, blah blah blah, or this movie, and I just don't know what, 
I don't know, I have no frame of reference for what they worked on. But when they said that they worked on Once Upon a Time, I was like, oh yeah, fuck yeah. Oh yeah, I was watching Vice in um, 2016. Wow. Wilfred. Glow. Iron Fist. Man Seeking Woman is really great. The Path is really good. The Wire. I actually was a costumer for a high school play. Okay, well my cat misses me. He wants to be back in my lap, but I can't get him. Oh my gosh, it's after 4 a.m. All right. Yeah, thanks for joining me. Thanks for keeping me company. Good night.